Good evening. I wanted to welcome all of you to Sharsharet's national webinar, You, Your Family, and Your Jewish Cancer Genes, Everything You Need to Know. We are excited that so many of you have joined us tonight and that many states across the country are represented this evening. My name is Bonnie Beckoff, and I am the Senior Support Program Coordinator for Sharsharet. I'm happy to be here moderating tonight's webinar. Sharsharet supports young Jewish women and families facing breast and ovarian cancer at every stage. We help you connect to our community, whatever your personal background, stage of life, genetic risk, diagnosis, or treatment. We would like to thank AstraZeneca, Myriad, the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, the Florence and Lawrence Spungen Family Foundation, the Marcus Foundation, and the Sigmund Sigmund and Edith Blumenthal Memorial Fund for their ongoing support and sponsoring tonight's program. As many of you know, one in 500 individuals in the general population carry the BRCA mutation. For those individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, the number increases to one in 40. This means that Ashkenazi Jews are 10 times more likely to carry the BRCA mutation, resulting in as high as 80% lifetime risk of being diagnosed with breast cancer and as high as 44% lifetime risk of being diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Sharsharit is often posed with the questions of how to communicate with family members about a BRCA diagnosis. When should one tell a family member? What are the risks and why is it important to know one's family history and genetic history? Communication with one's family members can vary within one's family structure and family dynamics. Often there are families who are private about their family history due to cultural stigmas or generational re relevance. Often at Sharsharet, we are posed with these confusing and conflicting questions about genetics. Tonight's webinar will answer your most commonly asked questions. Before I introduce our speaker for the evening, you can ask questions throughout the webinar by typing in the question box on your dashboard on the right side of the screen. Please keep your questions broad in nature so that everyone on the call can benefit from the discussion. We will try to get as many questions as we can after the presentation. Those of you who are not joining us via computer, please know that you can call Sharsharet at any time with any questions and we will be happy to discuss them with you. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ms. Peggy Cottrell. Peggy is a graduate of the Sarah Lawrence College, College Master of Science and Genetic Counseling Program. At Sharsharet, as our genetics program coordinator, Peggy consults with women and families and answers individual questions about their family histories, BRCA mutations, and personal risks of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, and contributes to the development and implementation of Sharsharet's hereditary cancer resources and programs. Peggy is also a certified genetic counselor in the Regional Cancer Center at our partner, Holy Name Medical Center. Peggy, the floor is yours. Bonnie, thank you so much. Uh, for that wonderful introduction, and uh, we'll get started here. So uh, I'm repeating from what uh, Bonnie said that one in 40 Ashkenazi Jews carry a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2. Um, and we would like to think that every time there's an inherited mutation in a family, we're going to see lots of family history of cancer, and it's going to be very easy to identify that this family is at high risk, but that's not the case. Sometimes people test positive and the family history is not straightforward. So why is that the case? Um, so there are some common issues that make it difficult to see what's going on in a family tree. Um, one thing that's unique um, to Ashkenazim is the Holocaust. And sometimes uh, there are family members who have been lost and families are small. And so we can't go all the way back and see what grandparents or great grandparents or other aunts and uncles might have died from um, had that they not been killed prematurely. Sometimes families are naturally small and people may not, may have few or no siblings, um, few or no aunts. Um, and so a small family gives us less information. Family members can be out of touch with each other. And we see this happen a lot. Someone might say to me, look, you know, I, I know I have cousins, but I really don't know what's going on with them. 
Sometimes we see families where there's a preponderance of men. And it's not that men don't get cancer when they are carriers of mutations in BRCA1 and 2, but they're much less likely to get cancer than female family members. Um, and sometimes people are just not really thinking about the fact that they can inherit a BRCA1 or BRCA mutation from their paternal side. So when we look at a family tree, we're looking at the branches from both sides, from the men and from the women, um, to see what kind of cancer is there. So current testing guidelines have broadened, and we talked about this a little bit in last year's webinar, um, that there are updated guidelines that are trying to be more inclusive so that we can um, test um, broader numbers of people and get that testing covered by insurance. Any Ashkenazi Jewish woman with breast cancer at any age meets guidelines. So even if you were diagnosed and you were 80, if you have Jewish ancestry, that's enough um, to make us suspicious. Um, and so that will be covered. Any person, Jewish or non-Jewish, with ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, metastatic prostate, or male breast cancer meets guidelines for testing. Any person who doesn't have cancer, but they have a first or second degree relative, and I'll explain what that means. A first degree relative means somebody who's connected to you on the family tree with just one step. So parents, children, siblings are first degree relatives, grandparents, aunts and uncles, um, nieces and nephews, those are second degree relatives. And so those people with first or second degree relatives um, as above will meet guidelines for testing. And then there are a whole lot of ways that combinations of cancers can add up um, to coverage. And then finally, recently, the American Society of Breast Surgeons came out with a recommendation that all women with breast cancer should be tested. Now, most women with breast cancer are not going to have a positive result. Um, but the American Society of Breast Surgeons is also um, don't want to miss people who test positive. And one thing we've learned is that a good way to identify people who need to be tested for us to test the people with cancer and then very aggressively test the relatives of anyone who tests positive. And that can be an important thing for finding people. Um, who will test positive. So those are guidelines. Um, there are other genes beyond BRCA1 and 2 that can predispose to cancer. And nowadays, most of the time when someone gets a cancer genetic test, their test is going to be a panel. And that panel may include anywhere from a dozen to as many as even 80 genes that are associated with cancer. Now, many of those genes are associated with more obscure kinds of cancer that are pretty rare and we don't typically see. Um, so I'm gonna talk just briefly about some of the other genes that we um, may look at. So there are some rare but high risk breast cancer genes uh, that we look at. PALB2 is not so rare, um, but causes a pattern of breast and pancreatic cancer. CDH1 uh, causes a pattern of stomach and breast cancer. P10 can cause a number of different kinds of cancer of the GI tract, of the uterus, um, as well as breast cancer. Um, STK11 causes a pattern of breast and GI cancers, and TP53 can cause young breast and other rare cancers, even in um, very young people, even in children or teenagers. Um, but thankfully, uh, these genes cause a very high risk, but they're really, um, for the most part, pretty rare, and we don't see them that often. Then there are moderate risk genes, um, for breast cancer, and these are more common than the rare high-risk ones, and they include genes like CHECK2, ATM, BARD1, NF1, and RAD50. 
Um, these genes may approximately double or triple the average woman's risk for breast cancer. So we're talking about instead of having a 10 to 12% chance, women who carry one of these would have somewhere around a 20 to 30. And again, it's going to be variable depending on which one we find. Um, and then there can be other kinds of cancers that are associated with these genes as well. So with CHECK2, maybe colon and prostate cancer. Um, with ATM, maybe pancreatic cancer. Um, and so uh, those are genes that are often on panels. There are also moderate risk ovarian cancer genes. Um, there are genes that predispose to something called Lynch syndrome, which is a pattern that mainly includes colon and endometrial cancer, but can also include a moderate risk of ovarian cancer. And I won't read through the name of, of names of those five genes, but those are the genes um, that cause Lynch syndrome. Um, and then a couple other genes like BRIP1, RAD51C, RAD51D, and STK11 that we mentioned earlier. And then there are a lot of other genes that are on the panels that are typically done and they can predispose to melanoma, colon cancer, stomach cancer, other GI cancers, pancreatic cancer, uterine cancer, um, and other cancers. Now, anybody Jewish could carry any one of these genes. But unlike BRCA1 and 2, we don't see that Jewish women have such a high risk. So with BRCA1 and 2, these are particularly of concern for Ashkenazi Jewish women because they are so much more common than in the general population. That is not the case with any of these other genes that we look at. Now, it's possible that there are people out there who have more questions. Maybe you've tested positive for one of these genes and you're like some more detail. I'm not going to spend any more time here tonight, um, but certainly uh, give us a call and you can set up an appointment. I'd be happy to go into more detail if you have questions. So why would people even get tested? How, how is it beneficial? Is this just look, being able to look into the future and know that something might happen? And if that was the case, we might not really be so compelled. But there are unique medical management options that people can consider that can significantly reduce their risk of dying from cancer. Um, and research supports the fact that genetic testing saves lives. We don't always know for sure whose life we have saved, but we are sure from the data that we are saving lives. Now, everybody tends to think of the uh, big things that can be done, prophylactic surgery or risk reducing surgery as we sometimes call it, but even enhanced screening, so the ability to do um, a breast MRI once a year makes a significant difference in terms of survival. And that's why it's so important for women to know if they test positive, because it isn't enough if your result is positive to just get your mammogram and perhaps a sonogram every year. Every year. Research really shows that the MRI is an important piece of being sure that people live a long and healthy life. So cascade testing is the name of what we call the test when someone in a family tests positive, and then we want to test their relatives. And the idea of it is like a waterfall flowing through the family. And this, as it flows through the family, um, we have the opportunity to let people know um, and give them the opportunity to be tested. And here is where communication is really critical. It can be very difficult to talk about these issues with family members. And as hard as it is to talk about it with people you're close to, like your parents or your siblings, um, it can be even more difficult to try to talk about it with people who you are not really in touch with like more distant aunts, uncles, and cousins. But again, if we're going to get the message out there, those are really important people to communicate with because you have the opportunity to possibly save the life of these relatives. And I hate to be dramatic, 
but I think it's really important that we all think about the fact that it's not that often in our lives that we have the opportunity to save somebody's life, and this may be one of those opportunities. So who exactly should be contacted once someone has a positive result? Um, the first thing I wanna mention is that both men and women are important to contact. Now I said before that women are more likely to get cancer than men if they are carries, carriers of a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. But men can also get cancer. They can get prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and breast cancer. Um, and men can just as easily as women pass this mutation um, on to their children. So it's really super important for men to be aware as well as women um, of whether their result is positive. Um, so if I'm talking to someone who's tested positive, when I get to this point in the discussion, we generally pull out the family tree. And we're gonna take a look at all of the close relatives and talk about what the chances are that any of those people would test positive. Now, one of the first things we wanna figure out is which side of the family, <coughs> excuse me, which side of the family needs to be contacted. Most of, this, most of the time, this is coming down on one side of the family, family and not the other side. But sometimes, even though there might be clues that seem to make it obvious that it's one side compared to the other, it can be really difficult to tell. So one of the first things that could be important in cascade testing is to test the parents of the person who's tested positive if they are available to be tested. And then if someone's result is negative, let's say the mom's result is negative and it's come from the dad's side, now you don't have to talk to all of the relatives on the mom's side, and that can make the job easier. Um, and then you're gonna look at the dad's side of the tree and anybody who's connected by blood with you out as many generations as there could be needs to be contacted. And again, I'm gonna remind you, um, you may be able to save the lives of these people. So we really want you to talk to your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your great aunts, um, try to get that message out there. Sometimes what I recommend people do is call the people you're close to. Like let's say you have 10 cousins and there are two of them that you know pretty well, the rest of them you don't know so well. So call the ones you know and perhaps those people can help you to pass the information along to other cousins that they are more in touch with. You can consider an email to those that it's hard to speak with. Now I'll caution you, it may not be best to write an email that says, I've just tested positive, there's something inherited, it's BRCA1 and you're gonna get breast cancer. You wanna start with something a little bit more gentle. So you might consider something like, I recently had genetic testing done and something was identified, and the genetic counselor recommended that I talk to everyone in the family, so I'd like to figure out a time to speak with you, or email me back if you'd just like me to send you the information, um, so that you give people the opportunity um, to accept or perhaps not accept um, the information. Sometimes people write a letter, and this can seem kind of cold, but for people that it's really difficult to speak to, sometimes this is the best option. And a couple of years ago, I had a young woman who called and made an appointment, not at Church Herod, but at um, Holy Name where I work. And she had gotten a letter. She was estranged from her mother. She hadn't spoken to her in about 15 years, uh, but she got a letter from her mother that her mother had tested positive and wanted her to know. Now she was very angry about getting this letter from her mother. Um, and even after we did the consultation, we did her genetic testing, she ended up testing positive. She was still really angry. And I had to really remind her that her mother had 
sent her this letter. Now, obviously, you know, there was a long history there and, and there was a lot of anger, but um, her mother sent her this information because she really cares about her and wanted her to have this information. And again, may have given her the opportunity to save her life. So what are some of the stumbling blocks to communication? So for some people, it's just very hard to admit a genetic mutation. There can be issues with uh, guilt, the thought that you might have passed this on to people that you love, your children or your grandchildren can be very difficult. There's privacy issues. Sometimes people find out they've tested positive because they have cancer and they didn't want everybody to know about the cancer. Um, sometimes there's stigma, the idea that something inherited means there's a defect in you. Um, and these can be difficult to overcome. Sometimes for people who carry mutations who are older, there's an issue with legacy. Um, and the older people get, the more um, their self-worth is about not so much what's happening, happening to them, but what's happening to their children and their grandchildren. And again, the thought that they might have passed something unwittingly, obviously, um, but nonetheless, um, it becomes very painful to know that you've passed something like this in a family. Some family members are not going to want to know about this. And so sometimes people will, you know, a, a parent might say uh, to a child, um, I had this genetic testing done. And the child will say, I don't want to know about it. Or a sibling will say, I don't want to know about it. I'm not interested in finding out that information. Um, family dysfunction and estrangement. That was um, the first story I talked about. And I'll tell you a second story where I had a, a woman who came in for testing. She really didn't even meet guidelines, but she had Jewish ancestry and uh, breast cancer at an older age. We, I was pretty sure her result was gonna be negative and she ended up testing positive. And it was surprising because there was no one else in the family who had had cancer. So I gave her my instructions to call up um, her family members. And when she called her cousins, lo and behold, she found out that they had both had cancer. One had had breast cancer, one had had ovarian cancer. They knew about the inherited mutation and they had just not been able to call her. Um, so again, I can't emphasize too much. <coughs> Sometimes the story um, could really be that if people had spoken, there might have been an opportunity um, to prevent a diagnosis of cancer. Um, and again, it's really important to communicate this information. So now I'm going to move to a different area, which is talking to children. Um, and this can be a, a particularly more difficult, especially if the children are young. So how to approach this? So I have to start out by saying that every family is different. And there really isn't any rule about how or when to tell children about the family mutation. Now, I think all of us could agree that a five-year-old is way too young um, and that an 18-year-old is probably old enough, but somewhere in between what um, brings a child to be able to handle the information of knowing about the inherited mutation. So I generally tell people um, that it is often beneficial to wait to tell children about the inherited mutation until they are adults. Um, sometimes that's because it can be pressure on kids to want to know and want to be tested once they know they have that 50-50 chance. Um, kids sometimes don't understand that this is not something that they really have to worry about as children, that this is something that really only affects them once they are an adult. Um, and obviously, once children are old enough either to get married or to begin screening, that's a time when you really have to uh, pull yourself together and figure out how to tell your children about this. And um, again, I'll point out that if you have used a genetic counselor at some time and have someone to call, or if you want to call us at your share it, um, we can help give you some pointers about family communication that can be beneficial. Now, there's no magic trick that makes this an easy thing to talk about. 
um, and we have a booklet that I'm going to reference um, for talking uh, to your children about your cancer gene. And there are no magic formulas in that booklet, but it, it points out a lot of really uh, good ideas um, for how to communicate that information. Now, I will say that even though you might tell children who are under 18 about a mutation, it is generally very rarely recommended that children be actually genetically tested until they're adults. And that's because there really is no benefit for a child to know their genetic result when they're still a child. Because especially there are some rare inherited cancers where children can be affected and that changes um, our advice. But if we're talking about BRCA1 and 2, um, we really want children to be adults and their right to decide how and when to be tested um, should be preserved and respected. So this is our booklet, How Do I Tell My Children About My Cancer Gene? And so I'm just gonna reference a couple of the points uh, within the booklet that can help guide you about how to talk to your children. So the first thing that's really important is to take time to process your own results. Sometimes I talk to women very close to when they've tested positive and they feel that they must immediately go and tell their children, and maybe it's even adult children, that it has to be something that they, they do right away. And generally, that's not the case. This is something that you can take the time to feel better about your own mutation and what it means for yourself. And sometimes taking a couple months to get used to the idea that you carry a BRCA1 or 2 mutation and what your decisions about what you're going to do about that um, can give you a lot of uh, maturity and comfort when you have to share it with your children. If you're still in a state of panic and you don't know exactly how you want to deal with this yet, it's going to be difficult for you to not pass that panic along to your children. You need to consider, obviously, the age and the life stage of each family member. Now, I just spoke to someone recently who told me, listen, uh, you know, I know my oldest child probably is ready to know, but my youngest child is not ready to know, and I know my children cannot keep secrets from each other. And so this can also complicate the decision-making process and how you decide. You want to find the right time and the right setting. Um, so a time when there's time, when people are relaxed, when the family is all sitting together. You know your own family's communication style, and that's not something we can tell you, um, but we want you to follow along with what makes your family comfortable in having these kinds of discussions. You can break this challenging task into small manageable pieces. So you can start with a small amount of information and then gradually increase the amount of information that you share. And sometimes I recommend to people when they are teaching their children, even when they're very young, uh, we teach our children by taking them to the doctor and telling them about how we go to the doctor, that going to the doctor and getting checkups and eating healthy, that these are all important parts of taking care of ourselves. And that's the first important message um, that we want to share with our children um, in terms of keeping them healthy. And then you might eventually say, uh, you know, I go twice a year to get checkups for breast cancer because we have breast cancer in our family. Now that's not pointing out that there's something inherited, but it's a first step in that direction. So now the child sees, oh, mom goes twice a year and she's taking good care of herself and she's keeping herself healthy. And then eventually taking it to the final step of saying, okay, there's something inherited in our family that's causing this cancer and I've inherited it and it's possible that you might've inherited it. Um, avoid making it a catastrophe. Um, incorporate the positive things that can be done and the empowering health messages that are there, that there are things you can do if you, simple things like eating a healthy diet, 
and not drinking and not smoking go a long way um, to reduce some of the risk of breast cancer. And then you're gonna gauge the response of your family members um, or children, see how um, they're adjusting to this new information. And then over time, you're gonna reinforce the support and continue the conversation um, as children might eventually um, be ready to actually consider testing themselves. So what's next? So um, what we at Sharsheret want you all to know is that you're not alone. Um, we are here to help you through all of these processes. Uh, you can contact me by calling the Sharsheret office um, I'm not here all the time, but you can set up an appointment to have a half an hour to talk to me. And in that situation, I can really talk to you specifically um, about the unique factors of your family, of your cancer, of your inherited mutation, um, and help you figure out um, the best pathway to take. Uh, Sharsheret doesn't offer any genetic testing, but all of the conversations that we have um, are confidential, um, individualized, and free. And we have lots of materials that we can send to you, our booklet about talking to your children, our booklet, Your Jewish Genes, and lots of other information as well um, that can help guide you um, as you head down this pathway. Um, so again, our Genetics for Life program, um, that includes myself as a genetic counselor, you can speak one-on-one -on -one with me. We also provide free family conference calls. So if you feel like you want to have somebody to negotiate uh, between you and a family member and help you explain what the issues are, we can set up a conference call between you and a family member. And again, our booklets have a wealth of information that can provide you um, with the knowledge that you may need to make it easier to share this. And of course, we are always happy to talk to your family members. So if you talk to someone and they're like, oh my goodness, I, what have you just told me and what do I do next? Um, you can tell them to be in touch with us and we'll be happy uh, to help them out. Thank you, Peggy. That was amazing. Super informative. We really appreciate you sharing all that wonderful information. It is now my pleasure to introduce Debbie Spungen. Debbie is a carrier of the BRCA gene mutation and involved in the education of genetic testing. She has also been the family caregiver for her parents and understands the need for support in this field. Debbie also serves on the Board of Trustees for her family's foundation, the Florence and Lawrence Spungen Family Foundation, whose mission is to improve the quality of life of individuals and families facing health challenges, and to address issues that particularly affect the Jewish community. Not only do we thank the Florence and Lawrence Spungen Family Foundation for being a part of tonight's webinar, but for their constant support of all we do at, for all they do for all they do for Sharsharet. So without any further ado, I would like to ask Debbie to share her personal story about her family history and navigating her genetic risk. Debbie, you can now unmute yourself. Debbie, if you click on the button on the type right-hand corner, there's a microphone and you can unmute yourself and then everyone can hear you speak. I do, okay. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Great, okay. So um, thank you so much for all of your information. I wish I had all that information when I went through it in 2006. Um, I was tested because my mother had ovarian cancer. 
So my whole family, I have uh, three siblings and we were all tested. It was almost like a little group family fun thing. You know, we all got tested and uh, three, of, three out of four of us were um, po uh, positive for the mutation. Uh, I was also a caregiver of my mother who had ovarian through the, because of the BRCA mutation. Um, I, um, I, I, I did everything you guys told me to do, the, all the doctors at that time. I did the, um, I did a mastect, uh, no, nah, I did a lumpectomy and I did the oophorectomy. And um, I had three out of four doctors said, if, we, if you don't do the um, mastectomy, we won't see you. So of course I went to the doctor that said, we won't do it. <laughs> so, and so far so good. I get a test every six months and it's all good. Um, with regard to my family, I, um, I'm the only female of four. Um, out of three of us, I was the only female that had the mutation. So therefore I'm the only one who had to do anything about it. So it was almost minimized in many ways. And I had no support at that time. So that's just, that's my experience at that time. I mean, I was told driving to work, a counselor called me on the phone on the way to work and said, by the way, you are positive. I, I pulled over to the side of the road. I thought I'd be great. And I just started crying because I had, I had fear. So I did everything I was supposed to do. Um, I was not forthcoming as much with my family. Um, since then, uh, some people have been tested and they have been positive and the people who have not been tested are not positive. So the people who have been tested are, are positive for the mutation. Um, no one else has been tested. So does that make sense? Um, therefore that no one else, um, everyone who's been tested has been um, positive for the mutation and no one else has been tested. So no one else um, went to that degree. Um, I think the support that you guys give is amazing. I would have loved to have had that at that time. Um, I do feel that being tested helped save my life in many ways. I wouldn't have known otherwise what to do. Um, today, uh, I have guilt. I have a lot of guilt about um, passing it on to the next generation. And that's my own stuff. So I try to let that go. Um, but otherwise, I get tested every six months. I go for an MRI, and every six months I go for a mammogram, and I have been completely healthy. So I've been very lucky, and I'm very grateful that I'm able, you know, to have had this experience and been had the awareness, which I feel is more prevalent today than it was in the past. Thank you, Debbie. That was really amazing. Sharsharit is so grateful that you shared your experience, and I am sure many of our listeners tonight feel comforted by hearing your experience as they may have been through a similar situation as you. If anyone listening would like to connect with a peer supporter, please contact Sharsharit and a member of our support team can assist you. We will now begin our question and answer period. Again, you can type your questions in the, in the text box located to the right of your screen. We have been receiving questions throughout the webinar, so we are going to delve right in. The first question is, I have a strong family history of breast cancer, but my genetic testing is negative. What does this mean? Um, so we know that there are lots of genetic factors that haven't been discovered yet that can be predisposing to cancer. So when we have someone with a strong pattern in their family, we have to figure that there's a possibility that something could have been inherited um, that is concerning. And so 
each individual who is in this situation needs to have their family history evaluated to determine exactly what kind of screening has to be done going forward. Okay, here's another question that came in. If I last tested 10 years ago and have the BRCA2 mutation, should I get tested for one of those new panels? So in general, what we say is if you carry a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, um, the only time we would encourage you to be tested again is if there was something in your family that really didn't, couldn't be explained by a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. So for example, if someone has a BRCA2 mutation, but on one side of their family, there's a whole lot of colon cancer. So a lot of colon cancer is not gonna be explained by the BRCA2 mutation. And so it could be possible that there is a second mutation that's causing cancer. But I will tell you, it's pretty rare for people to have more than one mutation. And so generally people who have tested positive don't need to have an updated test. Now, people who had testing 10 years ago and their results were negative, that's a different question. And it, in that case, it would be important to consider having an updated test because 10 years ago, most tests would have only looked at BRCA1 and 2. And again, uh, you saw that there are a lot more genes that we can look at now and sometimes something helpful can be identified. Perfect. Okay, another question just came in. A female child's paternal grandmother had breast cancer and was never tested for BRCA. Should she be tested? Should her sons be tested? What's the right way to go about this? So obviously once people have passed away, uh, we can't go back and test them. Um, sometimes people ask, oh, I have a little bit of, I have, hairs from a hairbrush, we can't really do any kind of um, decent genetic test unless the person is alive and we can get um, a sample of blood or saliva. So this is going to be a case where the first or second degree relatives can absolutely get tested based on the family history. And in general, um, it's going to vary from family to family, but usually the person who is closest to the person who had cancer. So in this case, it would be the granddaughter would be a good person to have testing first. And then if something was identified or if there was risk on the father's side of the family, in either case, then the sons could go on to be tested. And again, I'll say um, these are generalized answers. Um, if you have sp specific questions about your own family, um, then uh, absolutely give us a call and set up a time to talk to me. Here's an interesting one. I'm a man with an immediate family member and uncle with pancreatic cancer. Is there anything to do to mitigate my risk? Um, so uh, pancreatic cancer can be associated with um, BRCA2 um, to a lesser extent with BRCA1 and then also with a bunch of other genes that are on the panels uh, that we test. And so if you have a relative who died of pancreatic cancer, um, then absolutely um, you are likely to be eligible for testing. Now the downside is, oh, you know, we talked about how we have really good screening for breast cancer. We don't have good screening for ovarian cancer, but we can prophylactically take women's ovaries out but with pancreatic cancer, we don't have either of those options. There isn't really good screening for pancreatic cancer and we can't prophylactically take people's pancreas out. We can't live a really a healthy life without a pancreas. Um, but there are studies that are being done all the time um, to try to find good ways to screen for pancreatic cancer. And so again, um, that would be a good reason to come in and get a genetic test. Do guidelines support testing even if my only risk is being of Ashkenazi Jewish descent? Uh, so this is a very good question and I get this question a lot. If there's no family history of cancer, the insurance is very unlikely to pay for the test. 
But nonetheless, sometimes we are still concerned that people who don't have a family history um, may have a small family or may have a family that predominates in men. And there are, you know, maybe reasons why there isn't a strong family history that goes along. And so if people are just concerned about Jewish ancestry, uh, they can consider um, paying for a test out of pocket. Um, it's possible to get a good test for about $250. Um, there are also studies, and there is a study called the BEFORE study that's available, not in um, every part of the country, but in um, some of the major um, uh, areas around some of our bigger cities. Um, and that's a way to get free testing. So if you um, want to get a test done and don't qualify with your insurance, it is something that you can pay for yourself. But again, we want to encourage people, if you're going to buy, if you're concerned about cancer and you're going to buy a test, um, you want to have a medical grade test, not a direct to consumer test, um, because that's going to be a test of really a good enough quality to be able to identify um, uh, cancer genes. Thank you. This one just came in also. What is a founder gene or founder effects? Um, so a founder mutation is a mutation that starts, and that's why we use the term founder, in a particular individual. And all mutations uh, before they're inherited from, from, um, from parent to child, um, they all start out at some point being brand new. Um, and then that brand new mutation goes on to be passed to a number of um, the descendants of that person and can gradually make their way through a population. So there are three founder mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. These founder mutations occurred, um, uh, scientists estimate, over 2,000 years ago. So they happened really before there was a separation between Ashkenazim and Spardim. Um, but based on population of factors that occurred in Eastern Europe, these mutations were concentrated among Ashkenazim so that they're more common and not so concentrated among either Mizrahi or um, Sephardic Jews. Um, there are founder mutations um, in many populations, not just in Jewish populations, um, but for the most part, uh, they don't make up a large portion of the possible mutations that can be there. And so generally we do, and, and especially nowadays that doing a bigger test is much less expensive. We generally encourage people to look for all possible mutations in a gene, not just the founders in most cases. So one person just wrote in, can you talk about how someone should decide to get tested, especially if they know they have a history of BRCA? So if someone has a history of a mutation in their family, um, then we do the test a little bit differently. And that's because we can do a specific test that looks for the specific change that's in that family. And very often, depending on the lab where the testing is done, it may be possible if you have that testing done quickly um, after the original person is tested, the testing may be able to be done for free. So it's really important if you have a positive result that you share that information with your relatives and give them a copy of the result so that they can take it to their healthcare provider and make sure that the test is done covers the mutation that's been identified in the family. So I think we have time for two more questions. Um, the first one is, what are the first steps if I decided to go get testing? Okay, so the first step is to find someone who offers the test. And so you can start out by asking your doctor. Um, there are some doctors who offer testing in their office. Um, we think that it can be beneficial to use the services of a genetic counselor or an, another genetic expert so that you get the correct 
test and the correct interpretation. Um, so if you want to find a genetic counselor, I generally tell people to go to the website of the National Society of Genetic Counselors, and you can find that at nsgc.org. Um, and if you go to that website, there's a hexagon there that says find a counselor. You click on that, you click on in person, and then you're going to do a search function that involves putting in two uh, data points. The first is your zip code. The second is to choose the specialty cancer. And when you do a search, you'll come up with genetic counselors who are available nearby to your home, which is, uh, is identified by your zip code. Um, and then you can call those genetic counselors and ask the questions. Um, when can I get an appointment? Do you take my insurance? Um, and uh, decide um, how to pursue that. In general, all genetic counselors are sending tests to the same small number of labs. So if you go to a big center um, in a city, um, or if you go to a small community hospital, the genetic counselors in both of those places are all sending the tests to the same labs, so you really can feel comfortable um, going someplace that's close to home, because the only difference is really the personality of the person you're talking to, the tests are gonna be the same. Thank you. So this last question is, do you have to have Jewish ancestry to contact Sharsharet? So Peggy, you're more than welcome to answer it or I can take you this on. Right All right, I'll take this on. So Sharsharet, although our expertise is with Jewish genes and Jewish breast and ovarian cancer, all of our services are there for everyone, no matter religion, age, demographic. Um, we are here to provide all of our resources, all of our services, uh, our clinical team, our outreach team, we are here for everyone. So please don't hesitate to call in. Um, and I think at this time, we're going to conclude with our question and answer session. Thank you so much, Peggy, for that really wonderful, spectacular educational information that you gave us. Um, at the end of our webinar tonight, you will all be receiving an evaluation in your email in the next couple of days. So please take a few minutes to complete the survey. Your feedback is valuable to us and we are committed to staying relevant by enhancing our program to reflect this growing and changing needs of the women and families of our Sharsharet community. A video and transcript from tonight's presentation will be available on the Sharsharet website. You can access it by going to www.sharsharet.org slash resource slash teleconference teleconferences dash webinar. I would like to again thank AstraZeneca, Myriad, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, the Florence and Lawrence Spungen Family Foundation, the Marcus Foundation, and the Sigmund, Sigmund and Edith Blumenthal Memorial Fund. I also want to thank again Peggy for masterful, masterfully helping us navigate genetics and Debbie for sharing her story and bringing their issues to light. I hope that tonight's webinar was, as help, was a helpful guide to navigate your genetic history. For more information or to speak to Peggy about your personal risk, you can visit Charcheret's website at www.charcheret.org or call us at 866-474-2774. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your night.